In this video, we'll briefly step away from talking about linear transformations to discuss the concept of basis orientation. Now, this is not a particularly important discussion for our course, but basis orientation is a very neat concept and we'll enjoy talking about it very much. Now, what makes the concept of basis orientation so interesting is that you can approach it geometrically and algebraically, and each approach offers its own advantages, as usual. So we'll start with a geometric discussion and a geometric definition. So consider this basis, it's clearly orthogonal. I'm also thinking of it as orthonormal. Now, of course, these vectors are slightly longer than the vectors in this orthonormal basis, but I just wanted to make it larger so that it's easier to talk about. So think of these vectors as unit length, even though they're out of scale with this drawing. And a basis is called right-handed or positively oriented or simply positive. If the shortest path from the first vector to the second vector is in the counterclockwise direction. And that's why the orientation is called right-handed because our right hand naturally curves in the counterclockwise direction. Our left hand naturally curves in the clockwise direction. Okay, so that's the definition. Now, it's clear that this definition has nothing to do with this basis being orthonormal. It would apply to any basis. Let me pick up two props and talk about this basis. Now, if you consider this vector as the first and this vector as the second, then this basis is still positively oriented because the shortest distance from the first to the second is counterclockwise. And it definitely has nothing to do with the lengths of the vectors. It's all about their respective orientations. Okay, now if you continue to open up the angle, this basis will stay right-handed until the second vector crosses the 180 degree angle. And now this basis, once again, this is the first vector and this is the second, is no longer right-handed because the shortest path from the first vector to the second is now clockwise. So this basis would be called left-handed or negatively oriented or simply negative. And of course, this basis would be negatively oriented as well. The shortest path from the first to the second is clockwise. So that's the definition. I think it's pretty intuitive and not that complicated. Now let's discuss a few properties of the orientation with respect to changing the basis. For example, what would happen if I flipped one of the vectors in this basis? For example, if I went from this vector being E1 to this, flipping or multiplying by negative 1. So now if this is E1 and this is E2, is the basis still right-handed? No, it's not. It is no longer right-handed. Now the shortest path from E1 to E2 is in the clockwise direction, in the left-handed direction. So now the basis is left-handed. So it's changed its orientation. So flipping one of the vectors, we could have similarly flipped E2 and then we go from E1 to E2, once again clockwise. So flipping one of the vectors changes the orientation of the basis. Keep that in mind. Well, let's consider what would happen if we were to switch the two vectors. They remain put, except we now call this vector E1 and we call this vector E2. What happened to the orientation of this basis? Did it change or did it remain the same? Well, of course, it once again changed. If this is now E1 and this is E2, the shortest distance from E1 to E2 is now clockwise. So the orientation has been changed. So flipping one of the, fig one of the vectors and switching two vectors changes the orientation. Let's consider one more transformation. What if I replaced E2 with the following linear combination? E2 plus any multiple of E1. In other words, what would happen to the orientation if I added a multiple of E1 to E2? Would the orientation change or remain the same? It will remain the same because no matter 
what multiple of e1 you add to e2, the resulting vector will be in the upper half. In fact, its tip will land somewhere along this line. But wherever it is, it's in the upper half plane. So the angle from e1 to e2 would be less than 180 degrees in the counterclockwise direction, and that will be the shortest distance. So the shortest distance from E1 to the new E2 will still be counterclockwise. So adding a multiple of E1 to E2, or more generally adding a multiple of any vector to any other vector, preserves the orientation. So let's now review the three properties that we have just established. Flipping a vector changes the orientation, switching two vectors changes the orientation, and adding a multiple of one vector to another preserves the orientation. Is there another concept in linear algebra that has the same three properties? Does it ring a bell? Is there something else that we have discussed previously that works just like that? And of course there is. It's the determinant. When you multiply one of the columns of the determinant or rows, but we'll concentrate on columns, by minus one, the determinant will flip the sign. If you switch two of the columns, it will flip the sign. If you add a multiple of one column to another, it will preserve the sign. So the determinant, or more specifically the sign of the determinant, whether it's positive or negative, acts just like the orientation of a basis. So that will be the uh, algebraic foundation of talking about basis orientation, determinants are the essence of the algebraic perspective on basis orientation. That's about all at this point I can say from the geometric point of view about bases in two dimensions. Let's switch to three dimensions. Let me modify this picture by adding a third basis. We have E1, I'm about to draw E2, and this will now become E3. And once again, let me state the definition of orientation. A basis like this in three dimensions is called right-handed. If by going from E1 to E2 in the shortest direction with your right hand, now, for now, there is no such thing as counterclockwise direction anymore. Counterclockwise direction only makes immediate sense when we're looking at the plane. When we're looking at something in three dimensions, we can look at it from above and from below, and what used to be counterclockwise will become clockwise and vice versa. So counterclockwise is not, is not as universal a concept in three dimensions as it was in the plane. So we have to be a little bit more creative with our definition, but here it is. We will now go from E1 to E2 in the shortest direction with our right hand. And we'll look at the direction of the thumb. And if our thumb points in the same direction as the third vector, then the basis is called right-handed. If it points in the opposite direction, then it's called left-handed. And you would achieve the same definition with the left hand. Okay, but let's focus on right-handed definitions, and synonyms are the same. A right-handed basis is said to be positively oriented or simply positive. Okay, so let me repeat. Going in the shortest direction from E1 to E2, we pay attention to our thumb, and if the thumb points in the same direction as E3, it's right-handed, otherwise it's left-handed. And once again, even though it's a little bit difficult to visualize, this definition does not really rely on the basis being orthogonal or orthonormal. It works for any basis whatsoever, even if the angles are relatively extreme. You can still go, and my right hand is used up right now, but we can still go E1, E2, E3, first, second, third. We can still go from first to second in the positive direction, not in the positive, in the shortest direction. I take that back, in the shortest direction. You, should, you have to visualize my right hand. And then if E3 points in the same direction as the thumb, then this vector is right-handed. And now this vector is left-handed because it went from being in the upper half 
upper half space with respect to these two vectors to the lower half space. So it changed its orientation. Now if I were to go from first to second in the shortest direction, the thumb will point in the direction opposite of this vector. The thumb will be essentially up and this vector points essentially down. So once again, the same situation as before. The definition is pretty robust. And I could ask you the same questions as I did in the case of two vectors. What happens when we flip one of the vectors? What happens when we switch two out of the three vectors or any two vectors? And what happens when we add multiple of uh, one vector to another or actually multiple of any number of vectors to one that's not within that set? So a multiple of two of the vectors to the third vector. And all of the answers will be the same. The flip will change the orientation. The switch will change the orientation. And adding multiple of some vectors to others will preserve the orientation. So once again, it acts just like determinants. So this completes the geometric approach to basis orientation. Now let's talk, I think more briefly, about the algebraic approach. So here is the algebraic approach. So the advantage of the algebraic approach is that it works in any number of dimensions. It works in two dimensions or in three. So when we're, we're talking geometry, we had to change the definition a little bit. Uh, when we're talking algebraic approach, the definition will work across all dimensions. It'll be completely universal. And right now I'm going to put this down and say one more thing about the geometric approach. So when we, were, when we gave our right-hand rule, having not used the word counterclockwise, I will now bring the word counterclockwise back. So this, if this basis is right-handed, which means that the thumb points in the direction of E3, here is a way to bring the term counterclockwise back so that this definition is a little bit more analogous to the definition we had in the plane. And the definition works like this. If you look down E3, if while looking down E3, the shortest direction from first vector to second is counterclockwise, then the basis is called right-handed. And do you see that now we are able to use the term counterclockwise? Because when we say look down a particular vector, we no longer can look at the whole thing from underneath and see something differently which was our reason for not being able to use the term counterclockwise. We have now constrained ourselves uh, to looking at the plane of the vectors E1 and E2 from a certain direction, the direction given by looking down the third vector. So the alternative wording of the same definition is a basis is called right-handed. If when looking down E3, the vector, the basis E1, E2 is right-handed in its own planar right. In other words, the shortest distance from E1 to E2 when staring down E3 is counterclockwise. So there you go. Now we're done with the geometric approach. Now let's talk about the algebraic approach. And, one, and let's start with orthonormal bases. So suppose this basis is orthonormal. And one of the vectors is labeled as first, another one is second, and another one is third. Now, if we take these three vectors in their arbitrary orientation and decompose them with respect to this, let's call it the standard basis, or this, we can now decompose each one of these vectors with respect to the standard basis and organize the coefficients as columns in a matrix. This matrix would be right here. And for reasons that should be apparent to you, we'll call, excuse me, we'll call this matrix Q. Now, schematically, here are the columns of, of this matrix. And this matrix is orthogonal. Why is this matrix orthogonal? Well, it's because its columns are orthonormal. And why are its columns orthonormal? In the sense of R3, well, they're orthonormal because they represent geometric vectors that are orthonormal. So this goes right back to our discussion of the dot product and the correspondence between the geometric dot product in the space of geometric vectors 
and its algebraic representation in the component space. So these concepts connect, and so we have a basis, excuse me, a matrix whose columns are orthonormal, and therefore the basis is called orthogonal. I'm partially embarrassed for this nomenclature every time I mention it. In other words, it's transpose times itself is the identity matrix, which of course means that the determinant of Q is plus or minus one. Why? You should remember the reason why. Taking the transposes of both sides, on the right hand side we have one, on the left hand side we have the determinant of Q transpose times the determinant of Q, and of course the determinant of Q transpose is the same as the determinant of Q, so what we have on the left hand side is the determinant of Q squared, and because it equals 1, the determinant of Q is either 1 or minus 1, and that gives us the definition for the ori algebraic definition for the orientation of an arbitrary orthonormal basis. If you do this decomposition and can you construct this matrix, if its definition is 1, then the basis is called right-handed or positively oriented. If its determinant is minus 1, then it's called left-handed or negatively oriented. And you can see that it's a very good definition because it behaves the exact same way as the geometric definition. And for this basis, let me see if I can, if I'm coordinate enough, let's see, there you go. Pretty good. <laughs> I'm gonna call this perfect. Ah, uh, let's see. Now it's perfect. Okay, and for this basis, if you represent the basis itself, with respect to itself, then this matrix will be the identity matrix, and so the number will clearly be 1. So for this basis, the two definitions match. And then as far as going from one basis to the other in terms of switches, or flip, flips, or switches, or adding a multiple of one of the columns to another, they behave identically. So without it giving a detailed proof of equivalence, we can kind of tell that these two definitions are equivalent, or at the very least, consistent. And this definition, of course, has the advantage that, number one, you don't have to use your geometric intuition. In some complicated situations, ge geometry may not, is not simple, and we're required to use algebra, and it's a, such a simple criterion. And, of course, it generalizes our ideas to arbitrary dimensions, which is what always happens when we bring algebra to geometry and connect them in a very nice way. And one other thing that we realize about this definition is that it makes sense on a relative basis. Our geometric definition was absolute in a sense that we could apply it to any vector, any basis arbitrarily presented to us. We could look at it, apply the definition to it, and determine whether it's right-handed or left-handed. With this definition, we can see, we can tell whether one basis is, has the same orientation of another, as another. Because during this definition, we refer to the standard basis. But there is really no such thing as the standard basis in our space. In R3, there is such a thing as a standard basis. It could be 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So there is one basis that's a little bit more special than others in some sense. In three dimensions, there is no such thing as a standard basis, and there is no such thing as a preferred direction. So there's really no reason to call this basis better in any way than a basis where E3 points down, and to call this one positive and that one negative, because it's no better than other. One of them is no better than the other. And in fact, I think we have a concept of what the right hand is, but it's actually something we're used to and it's not clear at all that if you, if you were on Earth and someone else was in a spaceship and didn't know which hand was his right hand and which hand was his left hand, that you would be able to explain to that person which hand is his right hand. So there are no absolutes and our space is not oriented one way or the other. It's all arbitrary.
So the relative definition has certain advantages. We could take any basis, construct this basis for another basis that we're considering and trying to determine whether it's positively or negatively oriented. Construct the matrix, find its determinant, and depending on whether it's 1 or minus 1, conclude whether its orientation is the same as the reference basis or opposite. And as a final note, even this definition has nothing, uh, uh, has nothing at all that would not work if the basis had not been orthonormal. Right? We would no longer have that the, definite, that the determinant is 1 or negative 1, but it would be a positive number or a negative number. And if it's a positive number, we'll call the basis right-handed or positively oriented. And if it's a negative number, we'll call it left-handed or negatively oriented. So this concept of basis orientation works algebraically and geometrically. It works in the absolute sense and the relative sense. And it also works for orthonormal and arbitrary bases. So it's a very flexible and very neat concept indeed.